And would you turn with me, please, to Psalm 130. If you are using the Black Pew Bible, uh, you'll find it on page 518, Psalm 130. Uh, before we read it together, I want to just say a, a few things. Uh, I want you to try to think for just a minute about all the sorts of things that you spend time and thought waiting for in a given week. How much time and thought do you spend on waiting for things? Uh, I mean, where do you start, right? This week for me, uh, had a little bit of a sickness, and so went to the doctor, and where do I go first? To the room that is reserved for waiting, uh, the waiting room. And then I go from the waiting room uh, into the smaller waiting room, and I wait a little bit longer. Uh, then I go from the doctor to the pharmacy, where I sit in another waiting room uh, for my prescription to be filled. Uh, and the rest of the week, I waited for those antibiotics that I was prescribed to kick in and get me back on my feet. And thankfully, I'm, I'm all better now. Uh, but it was a week of waiting for me. Perhaps today in your life, uh, you're in sort of a season of waiting, even as lots of other things are going, around, uh, going on around you. You are waiting, right? Maybe you're waiting uh, for a call back from that job that you applied to or that you interviewed for. Maybe you're waiting for a letter uh, from one of the schools that you applied to uh, to get back to you. Uh, waiting, right? See, even in a world where we have so many things on demand, Right? So many things on demand, so many things at our fingertips. Our technology really hasn't done away with waiting. Rather, what has it done? It's just made us more impatient, hasn't it? We are, we are horribly impatient people, and yet so much of our time is spent waiting, uh, which presents a particular challenge for us as believers, doesn't it? Because the Christian life, you really, when you think about it, it's really a life of waiting. Uh, it's why the Bible really talks all over the place about what? Waiting on the Lord. Waiting on the Lord. And our passage for today is just one of a plethora of examples that we could point to. And so what we want to do here uh, in the weeks that we have leading up to Easter, yes, Easter is coming up April 21st. What we want to do in these weeks leading up to Easter starting today is look at some psalms. Uh, and, and some psalms that highlight for us, I think, particular aspects of what it means for us to wait upon the Lord. Uh, and starting here today with Psalm 130, and we're thinking today about waiting on God in repentance. Waiting on God in repentance. So, Psalm 130. A song of ascents. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord, we... As we wait upon you, we pray that you would visit us here this morning with the goodness of your word as we've heard it read, O oh Lord, and press upon our hearts its truth and give strength to us by your spirit working within us to live for you as we, as we sojourn through this foreign land, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. 
Uh, so waiting on God in repentance. What, what do I mean by this? Uh, here's, what, here's what we're getting at this morning. The gospel of Jesus Christ, it says, right, that, that by his death and resurrection, really, Jesus has what? He has destroyed the guilt and the power of sin. He has, he has put sin to death, and yet we wait, don't we? Yet we wait for the final destruction of sin. We wait for our full and final deliverance. And we really wait in two ways. Uh, we wait on sort of the, the micro level, and we wait on the macro level. On the micro level, we, we await victory over particular sins that we struggle with in our lives, don't we? You know, anger, lust, pride, greed, selfishness, all these sorts of things that come at us like torrents and waves. We, we await full and final deliverance from the power of these things in our lives. And so maybe you in your life, there's a particular sin that you've been right, like play, praying and seeking the Lord for victory over, and it hasn't come yet. And so you wait, and you wait in repentance. So that's the micro level. But then on the macro level, we also await sort of in the big picture the full and final taking sin completely out of the world when we will be entirely freed from sin and all of its devastating effects and consequences in the world and in our lives. Uh, so micro level and macro level, we, we repent and as we repent, we wait for full and complete deliverance. And this is really what Psalm 130, I think, shows us. Uh, this is a psalm that is one of the 15 psalms uh, that are called Psalms of Ascents. Psalms of Ascents, they go from Psalm 120 to Psalm 134. Uh, and they're called Psalms of Ascents because these are psalms that the people of Israel would pray and they would sing as they were on pilgrimage to Jerusalem. So going up, you know, the, the, the scriptures talk about how they would go up to the house of the Lord. So they would ascend, they would go up. So Psalms of Ascents, it's appropriate uh, because if you are going to the temple in Jerusalem, what do you want to do? Uh, you want to repent of your sins before you get there, don't you? Uh, so this psalm is really appropriate for that context. It's a psalm of repentance for going up to the house of the Lord. And so, verses 1 and 2, once again, out of the depths, out of nowhere, right? He just starts crying out, out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. What's the picture here? What are the depths? The picture is sort of like we're drowning at sea, right? Out in the middle of the ocean, no one around to help us. Out of the depths, crying out from the depths. Sort of rem reminiscent of Jonah, right? Remember Jonah chapter 2, belly of the great fish. He starts praying to the, to the Lord. And how does his prayer start? It starts like this. Jonah in, at sea in the fish. I cried out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. And so you see, that's really where the beginning of Psalm 130 just sort of drops us, right? In the middle of the ocean, in, in the depths, we're drowning with nobody else around, no help in sight. You don't even know how you got there. How do you swim out of the depths? How do you swim your way out of it? Answer, you don't. You can't. If you're in the depths, what needs to happen? Somebody else needs to come and save you. Somebody else needs to come and save you. And here's the thing. What are these depths here in Psalm 130? What are the depths? The depths are the depths of his own sins and of your sins and of my sins. And we are all there. How do I know this? 
Because notice, what does the psalm say? Verse 3, right after calling upon the Lord to hear him, what does he say? Verse 3, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand? Implied answer, not a single one. Now, you may be saying, well, not me, right? I've, I've lived a, a relatively good life. And maybe that's true if you're sort of comparing yourself to other people, but not before God. Not before God, because remember, the two great commandments, what are they? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. And you see, each time in our lives, when we fail at either one of those things, loving God with everything that we are and loving our neighbors as we love ourselves, what happens? It's like that water gets another inch higher. And if you're like me, and you think about your life, you know that, that, if, that's an, if, if each one of those sins is an inch, the waters go well over a mile above your head. So out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. And so the psalmist here, you see, is, is drowning in these raging waters of his own sins. And he knows that he cannot stand against the rising tide. And that is where we are as well. As appropriate, it's an appropriate image, water, for sin when you think about it, isn't it? Uh, because if you're surrounded by water, what happens? It gets in everything. <laughs> uh, you, there's not an inch of your body that will not be covered in water. And so it is with sin, right? Sin, it, it affects every aspect of our lives. It affects our thoughts. It affects our actions. It affects our words. It affects our relationships. It gets all over our work. It gets, you know, it gets up in everything, right? And if you are going to be taken out of these depths, you know, you can flail your arms around all you want. Uh, you can swim all day long, but the reality is if somebody else doesn't come and save you, you are going to drown. And you are going to sink to the bottom. And nobody is ever going to find you. And so, verse 4 it's really the center of this psalm. Verse 4 is the hinge on which everything here turns. Verse 4, but with you there is forgiveness. <laughs> what, you know, what beautiful, incredible, life-giving words. But with you there is forgiveness. I can look to someone who will come and save me. With you there is forgiveness. And why is there forgiveness with the Lord? Psalm 130 gives an answer to that question that may be a little bit shocking to many of us. What does it say? That you may be feared. What? I, th I thought God forgives us so that we would love Him and that we would come to Him and, and we would have warm and fuzzy feelings about Him. Well, yes, He does forgive us so that we will love Him and come to Him. But you see, really, the, the love, love for God and f the fear of God really go hand in hand. They're sort of two sides of the same coin. Why? Because to love God, you see, is to know Him as He truly is. His love, yes, and His mercy, yes, but also His power, and His justice, and His holiness, right? The fullness, the wholeness of His character. And you see, when you know the holiness and the power of God, you also know this. If He was not a God who forgives sins, then there would be nobody around to fear Him, right? Why? <laughs> because if He was not a God who forgives sins, we would all have been wiped out a long time ago. There would be nobody alive if he was not a God who forgives sins. So, with you there is forgiveness that you may be feared. It makes me think of Isaiah. 
in Isaiah chapter 6, right? Isaiah has this incredible vision of the Lord in the temple, high and lifted up, seated on his throne. And what is, and what is his response? Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell amidst a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the Lord of hosts. Was that a, an appropriate response? Yes, it was. Why? Because holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He is holy. Holy, I am not. I cannot stand in his presence. An appropriate response. But what happens with Isaiah? Amazing. Isaiah does not die. But what happens? The Lord takes his sin away. The seraphim comes and touches his lips with the coal from the altar. And then he is commissioned to be a prophet to the nations. Fear forgiveness, and then he is sent. You see, the problem here really isn't with uh, the concept of fearing the Lord. The problem is uh, our messed up views of God, right? Uh, because, you know, we, 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 we contend in one of two directions uh, when it comes to how we relate to God. Uh, we contend either in a sort of licentious direction or we contend in a legalistic direction, right? Uh, on the one hand, we contend to have a licentious view of God, right? This is when you see God as just like a big cuddly teddy bear. Uh, or, or like a cosmic candy dispenser who's just there to sort of make you happy and give you what you want. Uh, and if that's how you see God, then you won't come to God for forgiveness. Why not? Because why do you need to be forgiven? He's just a teddy bear, after all. Uh, on the other hand, we can tend to have a, a legalistic view of God, right? This is when you see God is just like a cruel dictator, who's just out to, to get back at you, to punish you. He's just out to strike you down at the smallest misstep. And if that's how you see God, then you also won't come to him for forgiveness. Why? Because fear without love only drives you away. Like Adam in the garden, right? Hiding from the presence of the Lord for fear. Uh, not coming to God for forgiveness. But you see, the gospel of Jesus Christ paints an entirely different picture of who God is, right? Because in the gospel, what do we see? We see that God is, in fact, all-powerful and absolutely holy, and yet at the very same time, a supremely and infinitely loving and gracious, merciful Father, who is also at the same time both the one our sins are committed against, but also our only hope of deliverance and the very one who has already promised to be gracious to us and has assured us of the reality of the, that promise in the death of his own son on our behalf. Amen? That's God. And so you see... Only seeing God in this way will drive you every time to God for forgiveness. Every time. Like the tax collector in the parable that we read earlier, right? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. Have mercy on me, a sinner. And so, a thought inspired by Facebook earlier this week. A little Facebook theology for you. Um, a licentious view of God says what? A licentious view of God says, I messed up, but dad won't care. I messed up, but dad won't care. Right? Uh, a legalistic view of God says, I messed up, dad's going to kill me. I messed up, dad's going to kill me. The gospel of Jesus Christ says, I messed up. I need to call my dad. I messed up. I need to call my dad. Why? Because you know that you've offended your father, but you know that your father always stands ready with open arms to receive you again. Because in Jesus Christ, you see in him a God who loves you. And because he loves you, he is not a father who doesn't care what you do. That's not love. It's not love for God to not care what you do. 
But he's also, because he's a loving father, he's also not a father who just wants to punish you either. But because he's a loving father, he is a father who wants what is best for you. And what is best for you? For you to draw near to him in repentance and for you to receive every time you sin, no matter how badly you mess things up no matter how badly, to receive once again his forgiving, cleansing, restoring grace. Amen? Do you see the beauty and the glory of this this morning? Listen, many of you here today I know are just sort of weighed down and burdened and beaten down in your life with regret and guilt uh, and you're sort of wondering if God or other people can ever accept you, you need to hear this, beloved. With God, there is forgiveness. With God, there is forgiveness. Maybe you've done things that other people won't forgive you for. Maybe you've, you're somebody who, who you sort of feel, you've, you feel stigmatized even by the church because maybe you've done things in your life that, that the church tends to speak out a whole lot against. You need to hear this. With God, there is forgiveness. You know, and I really just feel compelled to say this this morning, the church speaks out a lot against abortion, right? And rightly so. Rightly so. It is an epidemic in our society, and it is the taking of an innocent life. But rarely do you hear from the pulpits of Bible-believing churches that the specific sin of abortion is a sin that is covered by the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ for all who trust in Him. And so I want to say it to you this morning. If you're somebody here today who's had an abortion with God, there is forgiveness. With God, there is forgiveness. The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses that sin and He loves you. Turn to Him and receive that cleansing, restoring, forgiving grace. And this church, I want you to know also, is a church where there is forgiveness. It's a church where there is forgiveness. And so because there is forgiveness, we repent, we draw near to God, and we wait. Because why? The tide continues to rise against us, doesn't it? Is the tide of sin, do you sense in your life that it's sort of rising against you today? Do you, do you, are you in sort of one of those times? Maybe you've been praying and praying and praying for victory over a particular sin, but it just hasn't come. That is why verses 5 and 6 are here, beloved. That's why verses 5 and 6 are here. Knowing that there is forgiveness, what do we do? I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in His word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Waiting. Have you ever seen any pictures of the Gulf of Alaska? Uh, if not, feel free. You can, you can pull out your devices and Google it if you want. Uh, the Gulf of Alaska is it, a really interesting place because it's this place where the, the, the melted glacier waters of Alaska come down and they meet with the, wa the salt water of the Pacific Ocean. And so because of the different densities between these two waters, they remain distinct. They remain separate. And you can see the difference between them. One's lighter, the other's darker. But they sort of, you know, they come right up against each other, but they kind of inter interpenetrate each other as well. Why do I say that? Because really that's kind of a picture of the place that we find ourselves in. As, as believers who still live as sojourners in this foreign world. The waters, two different, completely different kinds of water, have come right up against each other. How so? Because the living water of God's grace in Jesus Christ, like those melted glacier waters of Alaska, has come down to us in Jesus to cleanse us of sin. And yet, and yet... The raging depths of sin remain there. And we live our lives, don't we, 
sort of on that line between those two bodies of water. And, and, and so, though the, the, those depths those depths of sin, they cannot, because of what Jesus has done for you, they cannot ultimately kill you, beloved. They cannot. They cannot. Why, but though they cannot, they can and they very often do wreak all sorts of havoc in our lives. How so? They steal our joy and our peace, don't they? They wash away the fruit of the Spirit that might come forth from our lives. They, they take our hearts away. We are, we're taken away in the drift of, of other loves, right? They take, us, they take our hearts away from loving God and loving other people. And so we live our lives on this line between those waters that heal us and the waters that threaten us. And we wait for the time when we will be brought ashore, which makes it really interesting to me that in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 21, verse 1, one of the things that it says will be the case in the new heavens and the new earth is this, the sea will be no more. You ever read that and think, why? I suggest to you this is the reason. The sea will be no more because the raging depths of sin will be taken away entirely, once and for all, never to rise or threaten a single thing. Amen. And so the psalmist says twice, My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. The watchmen you see are those who would have their eyes open throughout the night, waiting and waiting and waiting for the sun to rise and for morning to come. Jesus would tell his sleepy disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane, what? Watch and pray. Be watchmen, watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Watch and pray, the morning is coming. Watch and pray, repent and watch and wait and pray. That is the rhythm of our lives. Repent, watch, wait, pray. And so we wait, but we wait as those who have sure hope. Sure hope. Verses 7 and 8, we conclude, O Israel, hope in the Lord. So from the depths to the hope. For with the Lord is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, and he will, re he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. You see, the end shines light on the beginning, doesn't it? It shines the light of hope on those depths that you may be experiencing today in your life. If you're out in the ocean and you're drowning, once again, your only hope is where? Not in yourself, but outside of you, that somebody might come and save you. And beloved, somebody in Jesus Christ has come. He has come. The hope of the Lord has come. Hope in the Lord. Why? For with him is steadfast love. The Hebrew word here is a very important word. It's the word hesed. Hesed. Uh, it's used around 250 times in the Old Testament. The English Standard Version usually translates it steadfast love, and that's a very good translation. Uh, when the Lord revealed himself to Moses in Exodus 34, he said what? I am the Lord abounding in hesed, steadfast love. Psalm 103, 15 and through 17 is one of my favorites. Our days, it says, are like the grass. The wind passes over it and it is gone and its place knows it no more. But there is one thing that lasts forever. It is what? The hesed, the steadfast love of the Lord, is from everlasting to everlasting for those who fear him. This is what it's all about, beloved, the steadfast love of the Lord. You know, one of the most meaningful moments in my life when my dad, a few months after the Lord saved me, uh, and I was at a, a very sort of a, a, a very uh, sensitive time in my faith. A few months after the Lord saved, saved me, I was 20 years old. My dad came to me uh, and 
you know, the, the, the initial honeymoon period of my new faith had sort of subsided, and I started to feel the waters kind of rising again. Why? Because I realized, you know, hey, the Lord saved me, but I'm still a pretty messed up guy in a lot of ways, right? Um, and so I, real, I started to realize I haven't been entirely freed from my sin. This is going to be a long, hard struggle. And at this time, sitting in my room, my dad comes, knocks on the door, opens the door, says one sentence, John, I just felt like the Lord wanted me to come up here and tell you that he loves you. One sentence. Walks out, closes the door. It was the Holy Spirit, right, telling me, John, don't trust in yourself. It's not about the strength of your faith. It is about my steadfast love for you, my unceasing, unchanging, never-ending, never-failing, inescapable love, out of which comes what? Plentiful redemption. You have been saved. You are being saved. And you will yet be saved. How can you be sure of this in your life? How do you know this is true, beloved? Because long before you ever heard of Psalm 130, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Hesed of the Lord, the steadfast love of God in our flesh, took these words upon his own lips and prayed these words and sang this psalm with you and for you. Because he entered into the depths. And he lived a life of sojourning as he, pilgrim, as he pilgrim, pilgrimaged through this foreign land as he journeyed to the house back to where he came, the house of his father. And he entered into the depths of your sin and my sin. And though he had no sin of his own, but, Hebrew, but 2 Corinthians 5 says, He who knew no sin became sin for us. Though he had no sin of his own, he cried out from those depths for you. And he died. He laid down his life for your sins to take them away. And he buried them in the grave never to rise again. And so now, because of what Jesus has done for you, beloved, that raging sea of sin is stilled for you, and you and I are brought once and for all into the eternal, calm waters of God's forgiving, restoring grace. And now, because of that, and what he has promised to yet do for you as you repent, and as you wait and as you continue to struggle, and as you wonder if it will ever end, know this. Know this today. With the Lord, there is steadfast love, and with Him is plentiful redemption, and because of that, He will, it's a certainty, He will redeem Israel, His people, and you included in that, he will redeem his people from how many, a few, a lot, no, all his iniquities. All his iniquities. He has delivered you. He is delivering you. And he will yet deliver you. Trust in that today as you wait, even as the watchmen wait for the morning. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, you are so good to us. I confess, O oh Lord, how slow of heart I am to turn to you and to truly from my heart repent of all my sins against you. Lord, I thank you that it is not about the strength of my faith, but it is about the strength of your steadfast love 
I pray for myself and for all here today who may be struggling in any way. Hold on to us, O Lord, and do not let us go. Hold on to us, O Lord, and do not let us go. And cleanse us once again by your grace. And give us, O Lord, mercy and strength and patience to wait on you. For your glory we pray. Amen.